but there's been something that's been on my heart that just so tied into where we we're, would be in the book of James. So I want to digress, if you will, to the Old Testament, the book of Judges, um, because I think the message today will also reinforce the message next week, which will be back in James chapter 4. So if you have the scriptures with you, there's also a few Bible in the New International Version, and the word will be also on the screen here. I'm going to read from Judges chapter 2, verses 7 through 12. Judges chapter 2, verses 7 through 12. It begins, The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him, and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance in Timnath Paris, in the whole country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. After that, the whole generation, after that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and serpents the veils. And they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They provoked the Lord to anger. Let's pray. Almighty God, take your word and instill it in our hearts. Lord, burn it in our minds. Speak to us, Almighty God, that we might hear from you. Lord, hide me behind the cross, that we might hear from you. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The issue, as I see it here, is generational responsibility. And uh, again, bear with me as I have to switch screens here to have all my various notes in front of me. I, I had mentioned before that, that I had made this switch into this largely because of where we're going in the book of James. And um, I was thinking about our communities, Elmira, or Madison, and Newark, and things like that. And, and there was a time that one of the elements of smaller communities was the idea that everybody knows your name. Uh, I grew up in Geneseo, New York. And, you know, I lived on a farm in Geneseo, New York, actually out of the village, so we were kind of out away from the village. But I remember as a, as a little child going into the town to get the mail, and you know, that's when we would go and get a little post box and you'd get your mail. And we'd go to get the mail, and we'd be walking through the small village of Geneseo, New York. And it seemed like everybody knew my father. We'd be walking down the street and my check out and one. Wait a second, I've never seen these people, but everybody knows you. You know, who are you? You know, it was just this everybody knew your name. That's the kind of the way it was for many years in places like Geneseo. Now even in Geneseo, it's it's not so much the same thing. And I'm not saying it's it's not a good thing, but there was something about familiarity. Everybody knew you. People would complain because they'd say, ah, everybody knows your business. Uh, but there was this, this camaraderie that came from there. But times have changed. Oh, my God, I was looking at the internet, and if it's in the internet, it must be true, right? I was looking at the internet, looking at population, and according to 2018 numbers, Elmira has a population of basically 3,400 people, actually down from the last recorded time, which was 2010. Massive has a population size of 8,900 people, again, down from 2010. Newark has a population of 8,800. So the first thing I thought about that is how many of us that live in these communities know people here? How, how many times do you go to, for instance, a restaurant or a grocery store in our communities and you know the people that are serving you? the people that are providing you with support or meals. Um, do we know their names, or is it just too much of a bother for us to know their names? You've heard me in the past highlight one of the verses that we had read here, that was Judges chapter 2, this idea of a generation that grew up that knew not what the Lord had done in all of Israel. And it's become more than a passing verse for me over, over the time um, recently, as I've had some communications with some of the area pastors, asking for the question, when are you going to open? What, what's your anticipation of open dates? And I, and I was actually surprised that in more than one case, but quite frankly, in the majority of the cases in the surrounding area, even in Canada, 
Uh, there were statements that said things like this. Well, we have an older congregation, so we don't anticipate we'll open until July or August at the earliest. Some even thought it may be September before they open their doors. And, and I'm going, wow, you know, wisdom, there's wisdom in the idea that if the older, older group, and I would be included in that, is more susceptible to the COVID-19, okay, you're showing wisdom and, and that's, that's a good practice. But what really stood out to me is that our congregation is an older congregation. Where is the next generation? Where is where are we in our generation? Some of you are in the younger generation. What are we doing to point the next generation to Christ? And, and it's it's it cut me to the heart because I'm as guilty as everybody else. Um, I know the neighbors across the street from me. I know the neighbor right next to me. But other than that, I really don't know a lot of my neighbors. There used to be a time when we would have a, a big block party at one of the houses. All the neighbors would involved in and we would get the ghost of long gone. Um, I was uh, thinking about Dallas, Texas. I lived in Dallas, Texas for a number of years. And uh, did not, and I, by the way, back then we talked about the Bible God. One of the things that was really neat, this was that would have been the 80s, what was really neat about the Bible Belt is you could be pretty confident that most people that you ran into went to church. And so you could meet somebody at the grocery store and stuff like that, and it was it was never a strange question to be asked or to ask, oh, where do you go to church? And 95% of the time people said, oh, I go to this, or I go to that. And they'd have this conversation. In those times, one of the things that the, the church encouraged was objects. You know, so the idea was, and you put on a little sheet of paper when you went to church, how many contacts you had. The contact was the idea that you, when you saw something, you said, oh, do you have a church that you belong to? And if they said no, they said, oh, well, look, they have to visit mine and give them information. That's a contact. It, it got to be kind of a, a little bit of a game <laughs> because every time we run into people, in our own church, we'd say, hey, are you going to go to church this Sunday? Well, yes, good, you're a contact. And then, of course, they would say, hey, are you going to go to church? That? So we'd have a 37 contact, of, you know, 90% of them were people that already are part of the church. But, but the whole idea was, it was something that was out of your mind. It was something you were encouraged to do. That is changing. When I lived in Dallas, I did not know. We only had back entrances. There's a driveway that came in, you go into the back of your garage, and everything was fenced off. And, and here is tell that see, I didn't know my neighbors. Right next to me. I'm all sorry, I did not know them until someone had the foresight to say, hey, I've got a special deal on these oak trees, or sometimes I remember the trees were these trees, and if you want to buy a tree to put in our house so we can make our, our area more tree, um, give me your contact name, how many trees you want, maybe they're basically giving with the zoning the law, you could have two trees in your, depending on the length of it. And, um, and then we'll organize a, a time when we can all help each other plant all the trees. And for those people that are elderly or don't have the capability of doing, we'll do their house too. And she also gave us a good idea, I like trees, and guess what happened? We all came out our front doors one day, on a Saturday, and we saw that, hey, there were people living next to us. Because normally we'd go up the back door, get in our car, go to work, and come back, and lock the doors. And so, what a wonderful time we had, planting each other's trees, and planting the trees of those people that didn't have the capability to learn, and the conversations that we had were wonderful. And after that, guess what? We knew our neighbors. And it was not strange to go and knock on the door and say, hey, how are you doing? Just having a conversation. But, but that has set, it's been lost today. And quite frankly, if you look at this COVID-19 thing, it is even worse. Because there's this fear. And God's not out of fear. But what's going to happen next? 
So I find myself challenged by these verses because I find that I fall short. It's so easy to be within myself and, and, and read a book or watch TV and not have to mingle with all the people. And, and now, right now, we have an excuse, right? Well, I forgot my mask. Uh, I don't want to talk to you. I was in, I, early on in this thing, I was in a Wegmans. And you know me, I have a tendency to tell stories I have to be careful about. I was in a Wegmans. And, uh, you know, this was, things were starting to get hot and heavy, and I, I had my cart, and I go, oh, there's no one here, do I get out there? And all of a sudden, the Wegmans lady says, excuse me, sir. Um, there's a line behind it. Oh, excuse me. And there's a lady on one of the little docks. I go, oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. But I, I apologize. I, I, I didn't see that. I apologize. And I went back and I moved to the next guy over. And there was a lady at the uh, counter. And there was a lady at the dock. And I went back to another dock. And I was sitting, standing at the dock. And, and I, the lady turned around and said, oh, Good morning. And she goes, Could you please move back for me? Oh, okay. Uh, it, it, okay? Yeah. <laughs> it was kind of like, oh, you know, it, it reminded me of, of my elementary school days when people would go, cooties! <laughs> and so, and I, you know what? That's not a, that's not a combination of that lady. She might have had an underlying, uh, underlying condition to it. There might have been a reason why she was very nervous. I don't, I don't, I don't want to think I'd be literate. It's just this idea of, I need more space! And, and, and quite frankly, it, it hurts us. It hurts us as a people. Because God has made us for fellowship. And we need that. Quite frankly, this idea of making sure we pass on to the next generation what we have heard and seen is the Lord's expectation. Quite frankly, it's the Lord's command. Moses, as he was getting close to the time of passing off his leadership role to Joshua. The book of Deuteronomy, where he, he starts, he does three things in the book of Deuteronomy. Moses first tells them what has happened. He, he, he reminds them all that God has done. And then he, he spends some time and he reminds them of God's commands. And he embellishes on some of those. What do they mean? And then the last thing he does is he talks about the blessings and the curses. The blessings if we honor God, the curses if we fail to honor God, if we, if we turn away from Him. As he transfers the leadership over. And in chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 of Deuteronomy, he says this. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen, or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Here's the critical one. Teach them to your children and their children after them. Remember the day the Lord, you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, when he said to me, assemble the people before me to hear my words so that they may learn and revere me as long as they live in the land, and what may teach them to their children. That's an expectation, that's our command, to make sure we're passing on what we have seen, what we have learned, to our children and their children after them. Now, those of you that have been here before know that we've gone to great lengths to do some modernization. New carpet, new design, new steps, so kind of a, a, a more contemporary flair, if you will, with the goal of not losing the character of this beautiful 150-year-old sanctuary. Not losing the beauty of this. I, I'm so, I recognize the value of some of the warehouse approaches that they have in churches today, but churches 100 years ago were designed for worship. And, and, and I, we didn't want to lose that character, but at the same time, we actually have to recognize that for some young people kind of like, oh, how about I want to go to that spot, the old church? You know, that old antique, wait, that's an antique. You know, where's the, where's the technology? So what do we have? We have some technology. We're, we're doing some things that different. Keeping the, the character without, without losing the character and also keeping the contemporary flair. But let me tell you something that's important, and I need to remind myself of this many times. Changing the building will not change lives. We can paint, 
you can redesign, you can add technology, and all those things are not necessarily bad or good, but that won't change lives. It's the Holy Spirit, it's, it's proclaiming the gospel, it's not only proclaiming the gospel here in this building, but it's when we leave this place. Matter of fact, quite frankly, you will reach more people for Christ than I will from this point. If you look around, you see what we had 10 people, 12 people. Um, if 12 people went out and shared what God has done in their lives with one or two people, guess what? <laughs> look what happens when the Holy Spirit gets involved. We need to remember that. At its founding, <laughs> considering the text that we just read, at its founding, the Jewish, na the Jewish nation was really about God and families. You read all the genealogies. You read all the, you know, this person was the father of this, and he began this, and he began oh, It's all about these family connections. Matter of fact, in the Jewish nation, in order to really show your Jewishness is how far can you trace your lineage back? You know, are you of a priestly family? Are you of a family? Are you from the tribe of Benjamin, of Judah? Where, where, where is your connection? That was so critical. Israel today is still a small country, but has a central government. It's ruled by a prime minister and a Knesset, the, the House of Representatives. There is a very diverse population. That many of you know that I had the opportunity to study in Israel a number of times. And, I, and quite frankly, I go there any opportunity I get. And I'll tell you what, I worked in, at Hebrew, Union, Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and some of the professors are Muslim people. Very diverse population. Palestinians, you know, Egyptians, uh, people from Africa. There's a very diverse population there, and they have a democratic process. They're, they get criticized a lot. They say, oh, you know, there's, there, um, what is it, what is that thing? Uh, uh, oh, I can't think of that phrase. It's often used um, together, but unequal. I can't remember what it is the same or not equal. I don't remember that, that term, but um, quite frankly, a Palestinian likely going to get better justice in a Jewish court than he would in a different court. It's a very, it's, you really need to understand that things are a lot different. Yes, are there clashes? Yes, are there prejudices? Yes. We all suffer that. We've been seeing that in this country today. But that's Israel today. During the time of Judges, you, you read about this move from Joshua as the leader to Judges. There's 24 chapters in the book of Joshua. The first 12 chapters in the book of Joshua are talking about the the battles, the goal to defeat those that are opposed to Israel, those that God has displaced because they have totally turned away from God. Again, that's a, another sermon, but um, God didn't just indiscriminately say, let's just wipe out these people because I want to. No. In fact, if you read the Old Testament, you'll find that God did not have them make the move into there until the fullness of their corruption, of the other nations' corruption, was, was full. In other words, there was no turning back. And if you read some of the history of Canaanite cultures and things like that, child sacrifice, things like that, and God at some point said, I'm giving it as much time to see if there's a chain, but there's going to be a time when the door is going to get shut. And that's, that's when the, the, the bad has started happening. So the division of the land happened, if you will, 12 tribes or the 12 places. Yet there's also this idea of mutual support. Because there was two and a half tribes, the, the uh, Lunanites, the Gadites, and half of the tribe of Manasseh, that as they were making the move and before they entered the Promised Land, they said to Moses, hey, we really like it here on the east side of Jordan. This is great. Can we have this as our inheritance? And Moses said, you'll find it in Numbers chapter 32, Deuteronomy chapter 29, and also Joshua chapter 1. Moses said to them, yes, this can be your inheritance. However, you must send all your fighting men to help your brothers and sisters get their inheritance. Once that's done, then you can come back here. So this idea that, you know what? 
we're a family, and we're going to support each other. You're not going to just park here and say, see you later. This idea of mutual support was important. But likewise, even though there was this unity and purpose, there was also tribal autonomy. One of the things that we didn't understand when we went into Iraq and Afghanistan and things like that, even though they had governments, guess what? It's still, who is the tribal leader? And, and guess what? The government might say, yes, you could do this, but if some person here that's the tribal elder of a family says, no, guess what? It's not going to happen. Same thing in the Middle East in the times of Joshua. There was this unity that ultimately came under David later, again, bouncing around a little bit here. But that tribal autonomy still existed even then. So the, 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 the tribe of Dan, the clan of Dan, they had their place. Guess what? It was the elders of Dan that were in control. And so there was this, this autonomy that they had. But they had a unified influence, the God of their fathers. Remember how God was always introduced? I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. I, it's always, hey, remember me, and this is my connection to your family, which I created. Now, prior to the temple being built, in, uh, by Solomon in Jerusalem, every year they would all come together in Shiloh, and that's where they would worship. I kind of look at that as a family reunion. They'd all come together for a common purpose of, of recognizing God and worshiping God and providing sacrifices, but the family was brought together. And so there was this unity. But something happened over the years, and it's it's something that required God to act in the text that we read. In the text of the first five books of the Bible, we are constantly being reminded that the people often forgot God. You know, they would look and they would see him do something incredible, like kill all the firstborn Egyptians so that they'd be released. Yet their, their firstborn were spared. And they put the blood on the lentil and the doorpost. They, they, they watched as God miraculously opened the Red Sea so they could cross over on dry ground. And they praised God. They, I mean, they had a real praise fest at the other side. And, and God allowed the hard hearts to stay hard and even harden them more. When Pharaoh said, come on, we can do it too. And what did God do? Boom. They saw that. They marveled. Later they saw God provide manna for them to eat. He provided quail when they were complaining about meat. But when any time things got tough, like when they were had their backs against the Red Sea, oh, we wish we were back in, in Egypt. Bondage was so much better. And then God would reveal himself. <clears throat> but when the times got tough, they forgot God. We're thirsty, where's God now? We're hungry, where's God now? They constantly forgot God. But as long as they had Moses and Joshua there to remind them and point them to God, remind them about what God has done, then they could keep their marriage and they could have hope. But what happened? We found out in chap chapter 2 of Judges, verse 10, after that whole generation had been to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord or what he had done for all of Israel. I've digressed enough, my time doesn't really allow us to go into the full historical backdrop, except to say that the, the generations in question were those who saw God at work during the Exodus, Red Sea Man. Those who were wandering the 40 years because of their disobedience, those that were born during that time of wandering, and now they're over with Moses, Book of Deuteronomy, and they're learning about all that God has done. Remember, a lot of them had died off. That generation had died off. So Moses, what did he do? He started by telling them all that God had done. 
so that they would remember that something happened. Some people would say to me, well, yeah, I guess they forget because they wandered for 40 years and they really felt that God was judging them and God didn't care about them. And because of God's judgment, he was gone out of the picture. That's not true. According to Deuteronomy chapter 29, Moses tells them, reminds them, during the 40 years that I led you through the desert, your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet. Um, I'm replacing jeans that are only three months old. Yet they were constantly, and if I showed you some pictures of some of the areas that they wandered in, it was, it, it was not friendly country. And, and they wandered in that, in the heat, and in the cold, and in the rain. Yet their clothes didn't wear out, nor the sand would be, because God said, you know what? Yes, there's judgment, but here's my grace. Your clothes, your feet, and taking care of them. Yet in all that history, someone forgot to marvel about God. Someone forgot to recognize that He is the awesome God, the, the God of wonders. Someone forgot to tell his or her kids about what Jehovah, Yahweh, God, had done in their lives. They failed to remind them about what, who God was by how he was called. El Shaddai, Lord God Almighty, El Ayan, the Most High God, Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is my banner, Jehovah Raha, my shepherd, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals, Jehovah Shema, the Lord is there, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, Jehovah Shalom, the Lord of peace, Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. They didn't tell them about who God was and reveal Him to them. And when we don't know what God has done, when He seems absent, when if He seems like the, the watchman maker that watched round the clock and then left, there's nothing to marvel about. If we don't know who He is, we don't know what He can do, we don't know what He will do. And every generation, has a responsibility to see what God has done and to tell other people in the next generation. I bet you if I spent time with each one of you and we just talked about what God has done in your life, you thought about it and you said, oh, there was this time that everything seemed lost, but all of a sudden, or, or some people were praying for me because I was going through this, this health condition and things like that. I really didn't think I was going to make it. But God did this. And sometimes it won't be, won't be so obvious to you. Sometimes you'll say, I'll give you a story. Here we go again. There was a lady. This is probably from my Dallas times. There was a lady who basically lost her income. I don't think I'm about the circumstances. But lost her income. And she lived in an apartment complex, and she would have encounters with this, this man who was very much an atheist, and she was very much a on fire, passionate believer. And she was, you know, he was inquiring of her, and she said, Well, the Lord is going to provide. I know that I'm going to make it. I, I, I know that I will make it through this. God is good. God is on the throne. She would, she would do her, her holy roller stuff, right? And he would just look at her with disdain and say, no, God, there's no God that's going to help you. And he would be kind of bitter in her face about this. And she just said, no, I, I believe that God is in control. And God will take care of me. <laughs> so one day, the man came with a bag of groceries, and he gave it to her. And he said, I just want to show you that God's not providing for you, but I can. He, he, he didn't see the idea of that. Because she had been praying that God would provide for her. And God chose to use an atheist to bring her food so that she could rejoice and say, thank you, God, for providing. Yes, yeah, she could thank that man. Thank you. But the bottom line is, how God chooses to provide for us is God's call. 
he's not necessarily going to open, you're not going to open up your empty refrigerator and all of a sudden it's going to be filled because he magically put it in there. Could he do it? Sure. Is he going to do that? Probably not. But he's going to put people in your path that are going to say, let me help. Isn't that part of what the church is for? Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, no one had needs. Everyone felt that if, if they had something that someone else needed, they gave it to them because they recognized that they needed to take care of each other. We need to be willing to tell God what he has done in our life. I've said it again to those of you who are part of this congregation regularly, you've heard me say this before. It's not necessary that you have all the scripture memorized, although that's good. And I encourage, I want you to be in the Bible daily, seeking after God and talking to God. But guess what? The thing that might make the biggest impact is you just telling people what God has done in their life. I shared my testimony once from a church, a church that I was uh, helping out, and uh, an elderly gentleman came up to me and he said, No and discount your testimony because it's yours. And no one can say it's not correct. People can say, well, the Bible's wrong, but when you tell your story, it's your story. And that often will make a bigger impact on your friends, your family, your neighbors. And you'd be amazed at how many times God opens the door for you to tell your story. When your neighbor sees the struggle you're going through and says, how? How are you making it through this? This is really tough. I, I don't know how you're able to keep it up or your stiff upper lip. <laughs> Guess what? What's the scripture say? Be always ready, in season and out of season, to give an answer to the hope that is within you, but do it with what? Gentleness and respect. We need to be doing that. What is sad when you consider the book of Joshua all the way up into getting into Judges was that the people were doing a lot of good things for God. They were obeying God in a lot of ways. They were trusting God in a lot of ways. Yes, they failed a lot of times. Yes, they forgot to trust in God a lot of times. But they were serving God to the best of their abilities at the time. They, they stepped out in faith. They fought great battles. They were doing all of this. They, they carried the Ark of the Covenant and the Tent of Meeting. And if you look at a full description of that, it was not light. But they faithfully carried it and marched in the order of groups that they were to, to march in and things like that. They honored largely the ordained feasts and offerings that God required. In today's vernacular, they were busy doing church. I call it different between churchianity and Christianity. They were busy doing the things. They were busy having elders meetings and deacons meetings. They were busy painting and, and, and tearing out and rebuilding and carpeting. They were busy doing all sorts of things at the church. But perhaps in all the busy, busyness of serving God, they forgot the God they served. And that's something that we can all be guilty of. I know I have been guilty of. I've told you some stories in the past about being busy doing, doing, getting ready for Sunday school and missing all the people along the way as I was quickly getting to my Sunday school to get everything ready. And the people that were seeking someone to pray for them. The constant refrain throughout the Old Testament is that they, that you may know the Lord your God. That you may know that there is a God in Israel. That you remember the God who brought you out of bondage. Constant refrain. Constant desire to, to remind the people to remember the Passover. Why is this day different than all the others? What was that? That was a, an opportunity for you to tell your story. Oh, why is this day different from all the other days? Because it reminds us of when God, and then you go and you tell the story of how you were released from bondage from Egypt. For us, it's not the release from the bondage of Egypt is the release of the bondage of sin that holds us tightly, that keeps us separated from God, that, if you will, is death. There was the, the, the time that Joshua and his group crossed the Jordan on dry land. God did it a little bit differently than he did the Red Sea, but nevertheless, they crossed over in dry land. And when they got to the other side, what did Joshua say? Grab 12 stones from the bottom of the riverbed 
and stack them up. What's that about? Well, guess what? Stones on the bottom of a riverbed are much different than the stones in the indigenous area. Because why? They've been rolled, they've been turned, they've been cleaned, they've been smoothed and smoothed. Is that right word? And they're put up, and so somebody would walk by there and say, what? Those rocks don't belong here. How did they get here? Guess what? Let me tell you how they got here. Let me tell you what God has done. Oh, that's me. And guess what? You didn't have to knock on their door and say, I'd like to tell you about Jesus. They came to you and said, what's up with this difference? We don't want to be so busy doing church that we forget God. We don't want to be so busy studying the scriptures that we don't hear what God is saying. But when we forget God, what is the result? We find it in the text that we read today, chapter 2, verse 11. As a result of them not knowing what God has done for all of Israel, it says, Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals or Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of Egypt. They found and worshipped various gods of the people around them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. I'm just going to fit in. Oh, you have a different God. I'll worship you your God because I want to fit in. When we let the good thing get in the way of the best things, we lose something. And so do those who follow that folks. If our kids see us compromising in our faith, it leads to compromise. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that we are staunch and hard and never willing to change, but our faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ should not change. And our trust in God should not change. How we worship, there may be some changes there. But who we worship should not change. Our text continues, verse 14. In his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he swore to them. They were in great distress. That's the result of when we forget God. We lose God's blessing. lose in a sense of God's protection. If, if you're not going to serve me, if you're not going to honor me, if you're not going to tell others about me, then what's the alternative? Let's see how you do without me. Yet, even in the midst of all that forgetfulness, dishonor of God, God in our very same text extends grace. Verse 16, Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of the raiders. Every generation has a responsibility. But if you're a parent or a grandparent, let me emphasize your role. People are watching you. If you're a grandparent, I'm a grandparent now of 10. And the kids, the grandkids, often will look to me more so than they just their parents, right? Because, oh, Papa! Yay! And, and so, you know, they're watching to see what I do. If I just said, ah, you know, I'll tell you something I do um, at our house. And it, again, kind of mandatory thing, but it's effective. Before we eat, we give thanks. My grandkids are over, and they start eating. I say, hey, kids, let's give thanks. We pray. I hope someday they'll remember, yeah, we pray to our house at times. How about always made us pray? Well, there might be a time that they rebel against that, but there's really a time that they need that. And they're going to say, remember, how about thought prayer was important? Me thought prayer was important. My mom thought prayer was important. Those are the kind of things that stick. Values are, I think it was Jake Dawson that said, more values are taught than taught. People are watching you. Like Moses, like Joshua, all of us are called to lead our families and the next generation. To tell them what God has done with our lives so that they can trust Him in their lives. 
that they may know that there is a God in Palmyra, Newark, Massachusetts, Fairport, Pittsburgh, Monroe County, Wayne County, that he's not a regional God, that he's the God of all. But if we don't, perhaps the final verses of the book of Judges will apply to us. It was a condemnation of what had happened as a result of the people being disobedient to God and kind for good. Chapter 21, verses 24 and 25. At that time, the Israelites left that place and went home to their tribe and lands, each to his own inheritance. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as he or she saw fit. If we don't recognize the Lordship of Jesus Christ, if we don't let, recognize that God is on the throne, and we just count him and we say, I want to live my life the way I want to live it, we do everything as we see fit, guess what happens? All hell breaks us. Something we need to remember. It's something that we need to repent of. Because the world's falling apart. And it's not going to be changed unless we let God do the change. It's not going to change unless my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, and call out. Then will I come and heal their land. That's what scriptures tell us. That too often, we're too busy doing church things and forgetting the best things. We are called to be a generation that makes a difference. So that the generation that follows us will know God. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for your words. I pray, Almighty God, that you will condemn each one. Myself included, Lord, you have cut me to the chase, reminding me of my responsibilities as an individual. To be willing to tell people about you. To be ready in season and out season to give an answer to the hope that is within me. So the question I have to ask myself first word is, do I have a hope within me? Do I believe that you are my Savior? And am I willing to make you my Lord? Almighty God, we give yourself to each and every one Help us to come to know you and to live according to your word and tell the world that you have come to save the world that are lost. These things we pray in Jesus' name.